Hello everyone, and welcome to Kerbal Space Program with me, J.D. Colley. Here you can see in the background we've got a, uh, another launch going on. It's for a satellite to complete a contract. And uh, I actually did a number of these. I'm only showing one of them, uh, and only briefly. But it's uh, pretty indicative of the set. And it's just the same rocket we used before with a, a slightly modified satellite in it. And I think in, with each mission I had to modify the satellite slightly because each contract has a slight, slightly different payload requirement. Uh, the satellite needs to have a, say, mystery goo module. I think that's what this one has. Or a, um, a material science bay. You know, just different science requirements. But other than that, it's just it has to be in a specific orbit. And so I, uh, I put up a bunch of satellites for that and... That's pretty much all I did, I think. They're just they're simple satellites. They're the same thing as before. I didn't really modify them much. But it's uh they're pretty easy to complete too. It's very cheap compared to what the payout was on the contracts, which is why I did them to uh move us forward in our our finances so that we could uh start upgrading more of the space center because obviously there's there's stuff that still needs to be done there and we have some expensive missions we want to complete. So uh, anyway, yeah, I'm hoping in this episode to um begin working on our ComSat network, and I think I mentioned that before in the last episode, we wanted to put up our Keosynchronous uh, satellite, and so I'm hoping to do that episode, that this episode for sure. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to accomplish it, but we'll see. And, um, I don't know, maybe that'll be my next launch, I have no idea. But, uh, yeah, and then after that, I'm looking to, uh, put up a network, a proper network, that actually is in, um, equatorial orbit, and will allow us to do probe operations in the Kerbin system, like the system of Kerbin's moons, not this system system like out beyond our sphere of influence. But anyway, there we go. I think that is complete, and uh, we'll go back to old me now. All right, with a few contracts under our belt, as we can see, we've got uh, an our altimetry scan is complete, the one we did in the previous episode. That uh, took like a day and a half in game to complete, but that's fine. I just did other uh, contracts during that time. And, uh, equatorial one, and there's a third one that uh, I closed the window, I forgot to keep it, so we're going to upgrade our VAB now, because we desperately need that, and we are going to launch a rocket that I built between episodes. And there she is, not much of a looker, honestly, but if we take a look under the shell here, we've got ourselves a scanner probe. Now I said I had a rule for myself where I'm only going to allow us to land on planetary bodies that we have scanned. And I need more science right now, desperately. But there's not a whole lot to get unless I start going to things like Minmus or the Moon. So, well, that's what this one's going to do. It's going to go to either Minmus or the Moon, I haven't decided yet. And it will orbit it and take an altimetry scan so that we're able to land there, because we want to know what we're landing on, right? But uh, the problem I faced is that uh, I don't have the solar generation yet to really sustain one of these calm DTSM-1s. So we're going to have an interesting time with this. Uh, that's why this has so many solar panels, and that's why I had to upgrade my VAB, because this was well beyond the parts limit. You As you can see, 46, I was 16 over, and there was no real way I could keep, get it any lower reasonably, because you need at least three solar panels of these little ones facing um, the sun at a right angle, basically, to be able to charge one of the, or be able to keep up with the cost of a COM CTSM-1. I couldn't guarantee that the rotation would allow it to you know, keep keep doing what it needed to do, because of course Kerbin's uh, orbiting the sun, and so the angle would slowly change. So even if I had three on one side and kept it for some period, it would not stay that way. So I would be unable to keep the satellite operating long enough to uh, get the altimetry scan I need. So we're going to launch this little rocket, and I will see you on the launch pad. We're going to be doing this launch in post-production because uh, while the launch itself went off pretty much the way it's supposed to, we did have a minor crash about halfway through, which didn't lose us any uh, mission progress, fortunately, but did cause us some problems with the recording software. So there is going to be a slight glitch there, and I apologize for that. I don't, I can't really control it because uh, I'm having the same problems that modded KSP always has, which uh, is that eventually it reaches the point where it runs out of memory. And so I can either restart after every mission, which would be stupid and take forever, or I can suffer the occasional crash, which I prepare for by saving a lot. So I've opted to take the latter route because it allows me to make more content for you guys and enjoy the game more. Um, but yeah, 
uh, there's a reason there's a saying in the uh, KSP modding community which is mod it till it crashes because that's what you do you mod it until it breaks but you know it's what it, it's fine um, and hopefully some of those problems should actually be uh, fixed in the next version or well the version that's now out but which the mods are not quite updated for yet um, as you can see there, there's that parachute on the side that's lit up and I think that actually might be related because one of the major problems in this version was uh, there's a leak a memory leak in the um, temperature displays when things heat, like uh, parts heating. It's not in the actual um, part heating uh, algorithms, it's in the display of those part heating things. And I did not turn that off, and I should have, and uh, that might have been related to it. I can't say that it is for sure. It might just be that, you know, ran out of memory as it usually does. But uh, yeah, so. We do have a problem there. It's not coming up quite yet. But aside from that, this launch went very well. Um, this is the last time I think I use that lifter as it is set up there. Um, I eventually add on some canards, or not canards, some uh, winglets down there at the bottom to provide a bit more stability because it had a tendency to like to flip over. The payloads weren't actually large enough to counteract the mass of the, uh, the fuel below, so it try it as you got going faster and faster it would think oh well we'll put the the more massive end of the ship into you know the trajectory and uh, so if you deviated really at all uh, it was very easy to flip over so I ended up putting some winglets on it it means that I have to manually control the ascent but yeah so anyway you can see we're just uh, raising our uh, apoapsis there and we're coming up on the crash right here unfortunately and there she goes that was where we lost it but we've skipped forward a bit and we're here getting ready to do our Mooner stuff. So uh, yeah, it's a pretty simple um, event. I actually probably could have done this one also manually. I think I end up using the flight computer for it, um, but that's okay. Again, I will usually end up using the flight computer just because I don't want to risk uh, connection loss. And uh, anyway, so this is going to take a while. The, um, the altimetry scans take at minimum at least a day for most of the contracts and usually significantly longer because you need to get a certain percentage of the, the uh, celestial body in question scanned and in the case of the moon we need to get 50 percent and so yeah it, it takes some time to get that 50 percent requirement I think there's just a um, arbitrary time requirement because it says a day and a half but I'm pretty sure that it will take longer than um, what nine hours of in-game time to uh, accomplish a 50 percent altimetry scan so we go took a little screenshot and uh, Let's see, I think we're coming up on the end of this particular mission. So we'll be switching back to uh, old me momentarily. But yeah, that was a pretty successful mission. I'm pleased with that. We'll be repeating that with Minmus later on. All right, with that uh, launch out of the way and the moon being scanned or surveyed, as it were, with our radar scanner, the Clairvoyance 1, we now have four contracts that look like they would mesh very well together. Well, three contracts. Technically one of these will not work out because we need exactly one Kerbal. If we had a um, tourist opportunity for the uh, two Kerbal thing we could do that, but solo to orbit, do we have to do that? We do. Okay. So two days, low EV, or EVA and low orbit. We're going to do that. I think... No we don't. Okay, so we're going to do like that. I don't think we have the um, Corvus pod unlocked yet, do we? No, we don't. That is a very useful pod to have, and we do not yet have it. All right, here we are on the launch pod with our very wobbly uh, Fate 2 launcher. Well, our basic lifter with the Fate 2 little manned thingy on it, which we're going to use to complete several contracts, one of which is going to be a little tricky because we're going to have to see through the fairings during the launch to do it, but not too bad overall. Um, we have the mission to launch a solo Kerbin into orbit and two, but we can't do that on the same mission, obviously. Um, orbit Kerbin for two days, and let's see, where's the last one? Oh, well, not the last one. There is test the Mark 1 command pod, which is the one I'm going to do as we're going up, and then finally put an EV, or perform an EVA in low orbit. Now, before you get worried, yes, I did just barely upgrade my astronaut center, so or my astronaut complex. So we are capable of doing EVAs now in uh, flight, which is awesome, and which of course will help us greatly when we actually do end up going to the moon and Minmus and other planetary bodies. So without further ado, let's launch. 
And we can take a crew report. That's fun. So we're going to monitor this particular um, test, the Mark 1 command pod uh, contract closely so that we make sure we grab that with the run test button right there. But otherwise, it should be a pretty standard launch. I'm not anticipating any trouble. Hmm. Oh, <coughs> excuse me. Got something caught in my throat there. It's, uh, it's muggy here right now. My, I don't know. It does something weird to my mouth. It feels all cotton mouthy. But yes, anyway, if we want to look real... Oh, wait, actually, no. Before I show anything, I should probably focus on flying, huh? I was going to say, we've got a few things in orbit now. Slightly more uh, satellite coverage. We're going to be able to expand our satellites quite a bit in the near future. But uh, once we, we, we still need science. We still need a hundred more science right now, desperately. Once we get it, and a few more credits to cover the expansion of our R&D division, we will be able to... Oh, there we go. Run the test. Cool. Okay. Now I can just fly normally. Um, once we do that, we'll be able to get the expanded solar panels. And those are the really big impediments standing between us and successful um, vessels right now. Because while I can technically accomplish the um, goal of making a satellite that can sustain a comms DTS M1, right now it's not great. It's, it's difficult. You have to put a whole bunch of little parts on there. It's just not very effective. So I'd rather save setting up the uh, remote tech um, network until we have those better solar panels available. So we're going to see how much we can get, how much science we can get from these few contracts and stuff, and uh, yeah, we'll see where that puts us. So I'm going to speed up the rest of this launch and see you in orbit. And here we are for our very first EVA. Awesome. I'm very excited about this. Let's take our EVA report. Glorious. We can let go there real quick and let Jeb just kind of enjoy the view for a minute in the Kerbin night. It's beautiful. Turn him around. There we go. No. Stay turned around. Second, we're going to have to have you get back in so we can do stuff. And take a picture. Okay, time to get back in. And circularize your orbit so that you don't crash. Get back in there. Okay, and probably immediately start burning. <laughs> yep. Fortunately, this rocket is very powerful for its weight, so I'm not really concerned. And we obviously have an entire another stage. I, I overbuilt this rocket considerably, to be honest. But that's okay. I don't mind. I don't mind having more than I need. It's certainly better than the other option, especially when dealing with things that are going to be falling back at down to the ground with Kerbals in them. So let's have him hold prograde. Oh, we're almost there. Actually, you know what? While we're at it, let's just pop that stage so that we can get rid of it. Get a little closer to the peri or the apoapsis again and circular as boom. There we go. So now we just need to have Jeb stay up here for two days. So let's grab Kerbal Alarm Clock, which was already open, add a raw time alarm. And just pop in a two there. Add alarm and when this goes off we can go get Jeb. Oh, and as you can see, we do have a connection to the Moon Surveyor, which is excellent. Um, that won't be a very reliable connection because, well, you'll only have a connection for maybe, what, two hours out of every six to the Moon, if that. 
and that's assuming the surveyor's not behind the moon at the time that KSC rotates towards it, but still, it's something. It does mean that we'll be able to point a, a comms satellite, or a satellite, satellites uh, dishes, we can point satellite dishes at the moon, um, if they're over, say, here, and the you know, KSC's over here, we can point them at the moon and at least slightly increase our uptime until we're able to actually uh, pick up our proper network, so that that's good. And honestly, I might actually just create a temporary network as well, but we'll see. Anyway, let's go back to the KSC. And we're not actually at the KSC, we're above it, but that's close enough, right? So anyway, we've done several missions between this segment and the previous one. However, I did not show them because they were just those contract missions. And actually, we didn't finish them. We just started them. We got the Kerbals up into orbit that needed to go up into orbit. And I believe we actually rescued somebody else. I could be wrong about that. Anyway, doesn't matter because I really didn't need to show those. We've seen that kind of stuff before, and it was very routine. What I did want to show you is this mission, which is the first stage in creating our remote tech network. And so what is this satellite? It is our Keosynchronous uh, Relay Satellite, our transceiver. And uh, just so you know, Keosynchronous Orbit is 2,868,750 meters. Uh, as you can see, I went a little high there because I thought that that satellite above was in Keosynchronous for a second, and it's not. But anyway, if you circularize at, circularize at that altitude, you will have a orbital period of six hours, which will mean that you're rotating around the Kerbin at the speed that Kerbin itself rotates meaning you'll stay above whatever spot you're at. This dramatically increases the signal coverage of uh, Kerbin, or not Kerbin, of the KSC over Kerbin, as long as the satellites or, well, probes you're sending up have a connection to this uh, geosynchronous satellite, this transceiver, uh, which means they have to have a comms DTS-1, but at that small price, they'll be able to hold a connection for far, far longer. This is going to be really critical in setting up our network, and that's why I wanted to show you that. So, I mean, as you can see, it's not the most optimal satellite. It's basically plastered with uh, those little solar panels, but it works. So, anyway, we've got that up there, and we are going to go back to uh, old me here. Okay, and with that, we have our first satellite in geosynchronous orbit. We can deactivate this to save a bit of power, and this as well make much difference but uh yeah hopefully this will have enough charge to make it through the dark side of carbon it shouldn't be too bad uh, we have 1600 um, charged there so yeah it does have enough barely so it enough solar panels to barely uh, stay up but it doesn't really matter where we rotate because there's solar panels all the way around this thing so we have it we have it set up pretty well anyway yeah, I think we are now prepared to begin launching our satellite network, or at least our our primary, or not our primary, our initial one. I'm not sure if it'll be our permanent uh, remote tech satellite network, but it will definitely be the one that'll at least allow us to get stuff done, so that we have you know full coverage of the planet. And then later on, we might move to a more advanced. Well, we will need to move to a more advanced one because we simply don't have access to either the solar panel, te panel technology, nor do we have access to the um, antenna technology necessary to be able to communicate with faraway you know, planets and locations. So, yeah, there we go. That is very nice to see set up, and time to move on to our next project. Unfortunately, it's actually time to end the episode, uh, but we will upgrade our research and development center really quick, and we do have the science to unlock those electrics uh, advanced electrics for our solar panels that we need. So uh, in episode 5, hopefully we'll be able to begin making our um, remote tech network, the uh, one that's in lower Kerbin orbit. And yeah, so I'm excited for that. Thank you guys all for watching. If you liked what you saw, please leave a like. If you would like to see more, subscribe. And I will see you next time.